Come on, and all God's people said, amen. Come on, let's give God praise. And we are glad that you are man, in God's house today. We're excited for what God's going to do in our, in our time here together. And we're excited about what God's doing. Let me tell you what we're not excited about. It's this cold weather. Hello. Um, some of you like it. I get it. But I want to acknowledge that, to the church that this week we're beginning a fast. And the direction for our church that we're going to be praying for in this fast is we're going to pray for a short winter. Short winter. Can I get amen to that? Amen. Short winter. Short winter. Uh, I do want to kind of follow up with something that Pastor Deshaun um, said and, and share with you guys. I, I, I'm asking, I want every person in this room, if you call Hill City Church home, uh, I'm asking you, would you fast with us? Would you pray? Would you believe? And, and listen to me, what we're, what we're doing when we're fasting, I love when he said this, and I want us to get this because this is the core. It's the core principle. We're fasting because we want more of God. We want more of God. So listen to me, if there's areas in your life where you need, you need more of God, you go, man, there's too much of me in this area. I need more of God. And let that be a focus as you're fasting, as you're, you're saying no to something. Man, make sure you're, you're making your yes to be definitive. Let me also say this. As we fast, make sure that you are spending additional time in prayer. Make sure that as you're carving sort of time out, as you're removing things from your life, make sure that you are also spending that extra time in prayer. I'm reminded of what Jesus told his disciples. Some of you know this verse. They said, they said how, how come we're not seeing these things happen? And Jesus said, listen, there's some things that only come by prayer and fasting. There are some things in our life that will only, that will only be moved, that will only be shaken, that will only see in the, the, the move of God in our life uh, through prayer and fasting. And so we're taking seven days. I also want you to know this. This year, we are, we are really endeavoring. We want fasting to be uh, a core discipline in our church. We don't want to just front load this at the first part of the year, but we want to have a rhythm throughout the year of fasting, a rhythm throughout the year of prayer. And so there will be times throughout the year we're just going to call ourselves to a fast. Here's what I, I hope, that in the same way that you have a rhythm for Bible reading and you have a rhythm for prayer and you have a rhythm for being part of God's house, know that fasting has been one of those core disciplines of the people of God throughout the generation. And so it allows us to, to say no to the, to the flesh. And so listen to me, we know it. We know what it's like to, to be hungry. Come on, we know when we've, we've maybe worked a little bit too hard and we, we looked up and the clock is past lunch. Have y'all done this a couple of times? You're like, man, I'm starving. That, that feeling reminds us that we are human and we require some things to survive. Fasting says, listen, no, no, no. I am more than just a physical body, but I am also a spiritual body. And I'm going to strengthen that spiritual man uh, to the glory of God for the good uh, of the kingdom of God. Amen? We're going to fast uh, this week. You guys ready for God's word? All right, four of you. Awesome. Um, not sure what the rest of you are doing here, but we're going to read the Bible. You guys ready for God's word? Yeah. All right, come with me to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, we are in our, our second week of uh, the, the series that we are kicking the year off called Once Again. I love that phrase, and I love the idea of, of us simply asking God, once again, would you pour out your spirit? Once again, would you meet the needs of your people? Once again, would you bring things from the place of despair into a position and a posture where we can see the vitality that comes only uh, by way of the spirit of God? And so churches, we're reading this morning. Let's just read the Bible together. Genesis chapter 26, and I'm going to begin uh, at verse 1. It says, now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar and to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. And to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statues, and my laws. Keep that in mind and come to verse 12 with me. It says, And Isaac, this is Abraham's son, sowed in that land and reaped in the same year, a hundredfold, the Lord blessed him. 
And the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. And he had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants, that Abraham's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. I, I want to preach a sermon over the next few moments, simply titled this, Ingredients of a Blessing. Ingredients of a blessing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you. Your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. There are a lot of instructors that we'll have in our life, a lot of mentors, a lot of teachers that will sharpen us, that will strengthen us. But there's nothing, no one like the Bible, like your word. Now, God, I pray in the next few moments you give us clarity of thought. You, you give us the ability to focus in to what your spirit is saying to us in this room. So that when we leave here, it's not a, an exchanging of ideas, but we know deep in our soul that the spirit of the living God has spoken unto us and will never be the same. It's our prayer. So God, as much as we can focus in and, and as much as we can submit ourselves to you, we do that. But we know, God, even at our best, we still require your help. So Lord, where we are weak, make us strong where we are in lack Lord you be our portion where, where our minds can't get there God would you, would you make up the difference move in us by your spirit and by your might we'll be grateful now and forevermore in the precious name of Jesus we pray come on all God's people said amen, amen. and amen I, I, I want to talk to us for a few moments around a a topic that, that in church, if you've been in sort of settings, uh, it's a topic or a word or a phrase that, that has been hijacked. It's a word or a phrase that has been held hostage. I'll say this this morning. Maybe you're here in the room and you'd say, Charlie, I'm, I'm actually new to faith. I, I'm just sort of trying Jesus out. I, I don't have a church history and I don't have a church background and I, I don't got anybody in my family that believes in God, and I, I'm not even sure if I fully believe in God, but I'm here, and I, I want to say this to you. Today, you're actually at an advantage because sometimes the words or the phrases that, that have some historical connotations to us that have been raised in church, you don't have any shackles that you have to shake off. You, you don't have anything that you have to get by or get around, and sometimes words and phrases, when I say they've, they've been taken hostage and I say that they've been misused or they've been, been misappropriated, what that simply means is sometimes good, meaning people have the ability to read themselves into something rather than allowing God's word to say what God's word says. Sometimes we can take the word of God and we can use it and we can bend it for our own benefit, for our own desires to prove our own points. When today, what I, I want to do our, our very best, I try this week in and week out, but today I, I really am hoping and praying and asking the Lord, I, I want to stick to the text because I want the text to speak to us and, and inform us around this idea of blessing. Now, now listen, many of us, when we hear this word blessing and you hear the fact that the, the pastor is going to preach a sermon on blessing, you're looking to see whether or not they're going to take up an offering after this. And I just want to let everybody know, we've already taken up the offering chill out. You're good. But when I'm talking about blessing, this isn't a transaction. When we talk about blessing. This isn't us making a deal with God. Many of us, when we think about the idea of blessing, we've either reduced it to that, or we've reduced it to this understanding that God wants to bless us only in a, a select way. And many of us, what we've done is we've taken that out of the natural world and we've only made God's blessing to be a supernatural experience. And it is that. God's presence is his greatest blessing to us. God's presence, friends, is the greatest gift he can bestow upon us. Jesus is our great reward. But what I want us to do is as we look through this passage, I want us to be reminded that this passage has no problem communicating to us that the way in which God blesses Isaac, the way in which God bestows upon him his favor, the way in which God smiles upon him is in a way that even the neighbors could notice. 
There's something happening and going on in Isaac's life. And there is a blessing. He is prosperous in his life. And it is not just prosperous in his emotions. It's not just prosperous in his mental health. But he's prosperous in a way that even the neighbors can notice. And so today I want us to look at this text. And I want us to look at this passage of scripture because I believe that there is ingredients. I believe there is a recipe. Now listen to us. We have to be very, very careful because I said this last week, and I mean this with my whole heart. Many of us are very, very good at trying to take principles and precepts in the scripture and reduce them down to a formula so that we can make a deal and have transactions with God. And I just want us to make sure we pump the brakes on that and that we live our lives submitted to the word, and we say, okay, God, listen, I want to do your will and your way, and I want to receive whatever blessing you have for me. Would you look at your neighbor right now and just say, I want God's blessing. Look at your other neighbor and say, I don't want your blessing, (laughs) but I want God's blessing for my life. Listen to me. I want, I don't want anything that God doesn't want for me. I don't want anything that God doesn't want for me. Now listen to me. I want everything that God has for me. I want everything that God has for me. If it is in his will for my life, I want it. If it is not, nope. I want us to look at the text because I think there is a rhythm and I think there's something for us to pay attention to and understand. You see this in the language. Verse verse 12, Isaac has a good harvest. Verse 13, very wealthy. He's blessed a hundredfold. Now listen to me, in Scripture, specifically even in the New Testament, whenever you see this idea of a hundredfold, it speaks speaks as the result of faithfulness. It speaks as the result of faithfulness. It's a responsiveness to the word of God, that hundredfold blessing. Now some of y'all are paying attention. You're like, yeah, I need that hundredfold blessing. Have you seen the price of milk? <laughs> Inflation's real. You're like, I don't, know, I don't need a cost of living increase. I need a hundredfold increase. Now the church is saying amen, right? Now we're excited. There's a sense for us. What I want us to see, though, is that God prospers Isaac. And I want us to, to pay attention and be sensitive to the ways in which he does. And here's the first one that I want us to notice and I want us to, to write down. If you're taking notes, I hope you'll grab hold of this because I think this is helpful for your life. The first one is simply this, that Isaac went and stayed where God instructed. Isaac went and stayed where God's instructed. So, so here's this is an important fact for us. There is a place in which you and I will flourish in our lives. I believe there are specific locales. I believe that God will call you and I to specific places for times, for seasons. Some of it might be generational in an area. But some of you have experienced this in your life. God's brought many of you here, and there's been a sense where he's, he's moved you even in a way that you didn't necessarily want to go. Listen to me. Some of you are living in the DMV right now, and this was not your preferred place to live. There are some of you that serve our our country in, in the military. And there are many of you that, have been, that I've talked to over the years and you've been, you've been stationed before in Hawaii. And then the Lord has moved you here. To that I say, may the grace and peace of God be with you. Because when given the option, Hawaii, <laughs> Northern Virginia, as much as I love Northern Virginia, it ain't Hawaii. <laughs> Sometimes God will send you to a place that maybe is not your preferred destination. And sometimes God will send you to a place that you didn't even intend in going. Here's what the text says. Isaac had an intention and a plan to go down to Egypt. And what did the Lord say to him? Don't go there. Don't go there. But go to a place that I'll show you. That phrase, doesn't it echo back to the interaction that God had with his dad, Abraham, in chapter 12 of Genesis? Abraham, go to a place, a land that I'll show you. Leave what's comfortable, leave what's familiar, and go to a place that I'll show you. Now Isaac is having that same moment. And can I say this to some of you? Sometimes the things in which you experience with God in your own life is an echo of what you've seen maybe generations previous to experiencing God 
and their life. And sometimes God is moving in families generationally. A lot of times we get hung up on things like generational curses, and we talk a lot about bad things that happen. It's passed from father to son, and it's in these different sort of deals. And I just want us to, yeah, we acknowledge that, but I also want us to acknowledge that sometimes the move of God is happening and the blessing of God is happening in people's lives, not because of their own efforts, but because of the efforts and the relationship that are in previous seasons. Can I just encourage some of you in the room now that you're here not because of the prayers that you've prayed, but you're here because of some, of the, some grandmothers? You're here because of some faithful grandfathers. You're here from some people way back in your history that you didn't even get a chance to meet, but their prayers and the dreams that they had with God are now alive and well in and among your life. I don't know if there's anybody else that would agree with me today, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the prayers because I believe that I'm standing on some of the prayers from people in my life that have gone before me. So when we say things like God once again, Once again, stir up praying people. Once again, stir up people who are willing to go to a place that you call them. The ingredient here, the important part of this ingredient is obedience. Obedience is the first movement that we make. It's the first part of this recipe, if you will, for God's blessing. It is to obey. And let's just be honest. Obeying God is not always easy or comfortable or convenient. And it always doesn't make sense. Some of you right now are so logical. You are so pragmatic. And it will keep you from being able to obey God because you are trying to work God like he's a math equation. And let me just tell you what I found over the years that I've been walking with the Lord. There are many times where the Lord is going to call you and I to obey, and it's not going to make good sense. But it is going to make God sense. There are moments and times in our life where we're called to step out, where we're called to do the thing that God asked us to, to go to the place that God asked us to go, and he requires of us obedience. Let me give you a phrase that I grew up with. I can hear my pastor's voice even now. So many years later, he would say to me, Charlie, obedience brings the blessing of God, and disobedience brings the curse of God. Now, let's just take a quick vote. Anybody voting for the curse of God in their life? No. We want the blessing of God in our life. How do we posture our life in such a way so that we might be blessed by God? We obey his word. God determines that we would be obedient precisely, wholly, and in the way in which God commands us to. God's not trying to negotiate. And many of us have gotten into these postures where the Lord has spoken a word to us and then we've tried to talk God out or make different arrangements and agreements with God based on the word that he's given us. And I just wanna wanna caution you in this moment. When God speaks a word to your heart, it's not open for like debate or dialogue. It's not open for you guys to work a deal out. Partial obedience is full disobedience. We're not getting partial credit here. God's asking us to be obedient, and he he intends for us to obey him precisely, holistically. That we are obedient, we're submitted to the will and to the way of Jesus. Why? Because obedience brings the blessing of God. The the second thing that I want you to to notice in the story of, of Isaac, you see this in the story of Abraham as well, but we're looking at Isaac in here in verse in chapter 26 that he planted in a famine. He planted in a famine. So where God sent him, it wasn't, it wasn't a great sort of time in that area. Sends him to a famine. And then in the famine, what does it say that he did? That he planted, he sowed in the land, and he reaped in the same year. So in the middle of the famine, this is when he is Planting, the word of the Lord, write this down if you're taking notes, the word of the Lord directs us, not based on what is happening around us. God's will and God's way isn't subject to making sense in our current cultural moment. God's word, God's way, God's will will ask us and call us to do things that don't seem to make sense because the kingdom of God is not operating on what we would consider to be odd, like logic or what we would consider to be comfortable but the word of God calls us to places just as it did Isaac. 
And let's not be mistaken that when the Bible talks about sowing, when the Bible talks about reaping, this is not just a passive activity, but it is something that is involving our work. And so when you see this text and it talks about sowing, know that Isaac is working. Isaac is investing. Isaac is giving of himself. Isaac's not playing it safe. Why? Because the Lord told him to dwell in this land. In other words, as long as you're here, be fully here. As long as this is what you call home, move in the neighborhood, put in roots, flourish in this place. Why? Because oftentimes God wants to use you and I as an instrument to put on display his goodness in the midst of other people experiencing famine. Hear me on this. This can be both a practical and a spiritual thing. Yes, it may be practical in the sense that sometimes in seasons of famine where things don't seem to be going well in your life, you might find prosperity. Please, friend, don't think for a moment that God can't get you the resources you need in your life in ways that are creative, in ways that are outside what you expected. I don't know if there's anybody else here in the room where you got to your months and there was more month than you had money. But God made a way. God found a way to work creative miracles in your finance. God found a way to bring things to your front door. God found a way for a promotion. Something that, listen to me, a variety of ways in which God can bring blessing to your life. But it's not happening by us sitting on the couch just going, okay, God, I'm sowing belief. No, I'm actually getting in and I'm doing the work. I'm getting in and I'm putting my energy and my effort into what God has asked me to do. When God calls you to a place, God calls you to plant seed in that place that you might flourish and that others might take notice of it. The third thing that I want to make sure that we capture in this is because we have the obedience of Isaac. You've got the fact that he's sowing a seed that he's planting in that area. But let us not forget this third ingredient. The third ingredient is is straight from the text. It is that the Lord blessed him. The Lord blessed him. In other words, it wasn't just his obedience. It wasn't just his seed. It wasn't what he sowed. It, it It wasn't his energy and effort. But it is that the Lord blessed him. Many times we focus on the what, the blessing, And we don't, or we forget to think about the who that's doing the blessing, which is God. Many times we get caught up as far as what the, how it manifests in our life, how God moves in our life, and we forget that it's God moving in the first place. Blessings in the scriptures are acknowledged as gifts from God. But many of us, if we're not careful, we we have blessing in our hands. We have things in which God has given us. We have ways in which God has bestowed his favor upon our lives. And we're not turning it back to praise. We're not giving God credit for the things in our lives. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be petty. Like I don't know if you're petty, but sometimes I can be petty. Here's a little bit of my pettiness. Maybe you identify with this. You ever given somebody something and they didn't say thank you? Now, you're probably better than me, but I keep track of that. I'm like, all right, you say thank you. All these kids want me to get them some. Never say thank you. If I give you a gift and and I wrap it, I don't gift bag it. I wrap it. And I give you that gift. And you're like, thanks, thanks so much. Appreciate that. I I want you to be excited. We we raised our kids, listen to me. As a young, as when they were young, we indoctrinated them and we kind of like shaped and molded their minds this way. My kids are some of the best gift receivers that you've ever seen. Because I wanted to, I wanted the experience. I knew I was like, man, I got all these Christmases with you. I got all these birthdays with you. I need to have some good, positive sort of like, I want some excitement. They'll open gifts and they're like, yes, this is great. I love it. 
What is it? You know, like they're excited. Even they don't know what it is, and I love it. But I, I hate the moment, though, if you put the energy, the effort, and man, you don't get a thank you. The person doesn't look like they're even excited about it. That's a bummer for me. Can you imagine what it would be like to be God? I know God's not petty, but can you imagine? God's like, man, look at all the, look at all the things I've done, and they, they don't even sing in church. <laughs> they don't even... They ain't even lifted their hands not once. <laughs> Band's up there playing so good. I'm moving in the room, like, and they're thinking about football. I, this is mainly for the first service. It's probably not for you guys, because, again, these are the saints of God in this room. <laughs> but maybe there's some blockages in our life in terms of the blessing of God flowing in our life because we don't. We don't turn God's good gift back to praise. So there's a traffic jam in your life and mine in terms of God's blessing to continually flow through us because we actually don't know how to give God praise for the things that he's done already. We take it. We, we enjoy it. We like the benefit of it. But we don't want there to be any requirement on us. Thank you much, God, for your salvation. Thank you for setting me free from my sin Thank you for giving me a home in heaven. Thank you for blessing me with abundant life now and beyond. But it's a lot to ask for me to lift my voice and praise you. I hope this is getting a little bit uncomfortable for some of you. Because the reality is this. When you think about what God has done, you're like, well, I'm just not really a, you know, a charismatic sort of person. I, Listen to me, I get it. I get thinking. I'm okay. Be contemplative. Think. But the scriptures say, praise the Lord. Lift your voice. Make noise on instruments. Shout. Lift your hands. Dance even. Some of y'all, if we caught y'all former selves, I know y'all know how to dance. But it's for the wrong reasons and the wrong purposes. We're trying to sanctify your life now. You know when the best time to sing and to lift your voice towards God? When you don't feel like it. So before you get to the moment, if you're driven only by the way in which you feel, oh, what a terrible life and existence that you have. But I want to move based on what God has done and I want to recognize the blessings in my life the fruitfulness in my life is not because I'm skilled, is not because I'm talented, is not because I have a work ethic, it's not because of, of those things. Man, no, no, it, this is because this is the favor of God on my life. This is God's hand on my life. I want my kids to know. I want my spouse and my family to know. I want my friends to know. Listen, had it not been for God, none of the good things in my life would be there. Listen to me. I am handsome. I know that. I am handsome. I get it. Back in the day, I had that, whoo, that hair. Your boy was looking good. And I know even on my best day, on my best day, I'm not getting Nicole. On my best day, I ain't got that kind of, as the kids say, riz. My wife is a gift from God, blessing in my life that I do not deserve. Most of my kids are a gift from God, <laughs> most of them. And I'm not saying which ones because it's a revolving door. Parents, could I get amen? Everything, every good and perfect gift if I would classify it in my life as a blessing, it came from God. So what kind of person would I be if in a life that has been so blessed, I'm going to withhold praise. I'm going to withhold the thank you. I'm going to withhold a posture of generosity. I'm going to withhold gratitude in my life because I don't feel like it because it's cold outside. 
Listen to me. I, I, I love you. I, I love you. I'm your pastor. I love you. I tell you that every week. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. But listen to me. One of the traps that we do in church, because sometimes we, we, we feel these moments. Here's one of the traps. And I do this. And sometimes I have to catch myself. I'll do this. Hey, how y'all feeling today? Yeah, who cares? Who cares how you're feeling? We're not here based on how we feel. We're here. We're here because of who God is. We're here because of what he has done. And for a moment, if I dictate my worship and I dictate my behavior in God's house based on how I feel, you understand half the year I wouldn't be here? Because my bed feels good on a Sunday morning. Y'all are here at the second service, so you are in your bed a lot longer than some of us were. Up here, amen in real life. Bed felt good. You were in it for a lot longer than all of us. Shame on you. Man, how I feel? Nah. My emotions, you, our emotions, it doesn't dictate how we praise. Nah, we're beyond that. Come on, right, family? We're beyond that. We're beyond that. When, when I consider the works of his hands, when I consider the way in which he's rescued me, when I consider the ways in which he has daily loaded my life with benefits, when I begin to consider the blessing of God in my life, I have to praise. I have to worship him. Because it wasn't because of my obedience. It's not just because I, I have the right recipe. No, no, it's because the Lord does the blessing. The final thing I want you to write down is this. It's the promise of God. The most important part of all of this, that God blesses his people because of his promise. The promise that God makes to Abraham is still alive and well even after he dies. Now hear me on this. There are some promises that God is speaking to some of you in this room. And you're holding it's a word in your life. And you may get glimpses of it. But it actually may be the type of word or promise that extends far beyond your life. Some of you here, it is going to be the generations after you that come to fully realize what God is speaking to you right here, right now. We got DNA right after the service and one of the things I say each time we kind of get in that room, the Hill City Church, we are a hundred year old church. We're just three years in the making. Listen to me. God, God's given me a God's given me some dreams and some words about this house. Nicole and I, we have a deep, a deep commitment to building and establishing a church that will outlive us, that will outlive all of us, hopefully. That when we are dead and gone, and we've given all of the hours, and we've given all of our resources, and we've, we've sown into, and we've planted, and we've toiled, and we, we've done all of the things, and we've invested, and we've watched God move, and we've seen the miraculous hand of God. We've seen so much over the years and over the generations. My prayer is that when you and I are fertilizer for the ground, that there's a church called Hill City that is still thriving, that is still reaching, that is still helping people come from darkness into life, from death to life. God's given us these, these words, these roots, and what we know is that they'll outlast us. And can I tell you what some of us suffer from, what is hard for many of us is we try to be obedient to the Lord, but we lack the purpose and the direction to actually keep us on the path. I'm telling you right now, some of you, the, the, thing, the thing you've got to get is purpose. The thing you've got to get is why God has you here and position where you are right now. Because if you had that, it would turn your life on its ear. Some of you, you wake up in the morning and you're just kind of like, you feel like you're going through the motions. It's like Groundhog Day. You're like, what am I, what am I doing? I'm, I'm just want to listen to me. 
you start to figure out why and what God has purposed you and planned for you to do, you wake up different. You wake up on mission. You wake up a part of something bigger than yourself. You wake up with something where you go, ah, that's it. Listen to me, Isaac doesn't realize that God has to remind him that Isaac, you are living a part of something bigger than yourself. The blessing that I have for you didn't start with you, but it started with your daddy. And the same promise that I made to him, it hasn't expired. And I'm just letting you know, this is God saying to him, you look at the beginning part of that five times, I will, I will, I will, I will. God's covenant with his people, God holds the heavy end of that bargain. He says, I will, I will, I will. I'll make you a great nation. He says, that same promise, I'm, I'm recommitting it. I'm letting you know I'm true to my word. I'm true to my promises. Now, some of you in the room, you go, oh, Charlie, but God may have given me a promise, but I lack the perfection required for that promise to come to pass. You ever have those feelings where you don't feel like you're good enough? for God to do the thing that God wants to do. Let me just remind you, there's a passage of scripture between what we read today. I just wanna invite you to go read it later on. I'll paraphrase it for you now. Because not only does Isaac inherit the promise from Abraham, he's also inherited from, from Abraham some kind of questionable behavior. And here's the questionable behavior. You'll be able to pick it out very, very clearly. We'll be able to identify and ID it clearly. Abraham did this, and now we see it Isaac. They, they come to this land, and they realize they're traveling with their, their wives, and, and they're fearful that their wives' beauty is going to get them killed. That these people are going to see these kings, these rulers. And again, remember that we're not reading this through 21st century eyes. We're reading this as like in the savagery of the Old Testament. That they would see that, and they'd go, ah, oh, you are now coming over here. And they would kill Abraham or Isaac. They both have this fear. So they concoct this plan. What do they do? They say to their wives, hey, when we go to town, you're my sister. Wink. And they go in, they go, hey, it's my sister. And then they, they, they take their, their wife. They don't kill them, so their lives spared. And then the Lord speaks to them and goes, hey, if I were you, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. And then they come back and they go, hey, why did you lie to us and say that was your sister when that's your wife? And both Abraham and Isaac both go, because we were worried that you were going to kill us and we couldn't. Man, that's the worst thing we could think of. And they say back to them, but what do you think God would have done to us? Now, what is that called? Abraham and Isaac are both, they both what? They lied. Y'all didn't know that was a lie? Some of y'all lie so much that seemed normal. Is that what you're telling me? They're liars. They're telling lies. But their imperfection doesn't cancel out the perfect plan of God. And that's a place for the church to say amen. Our imperfections does not cancel out the perfect plan of God. Our imperfections does not cancel out what God desires for your life and for mine. God never had the requirement on us to be perfect in order for his will to be done in our life. It's not a permission for us to continue to sin because as you see in these passages, there's some things and some character things that are worked on and worked out of Abraham and worked out of Isaac. And some of you need to hear this word. There's some things that you inherited from your family members in the way in which you're conducting your lives and you need to get free from because you're living in a way that is historical, but it is not a way that is holy. And God wants to help break some of those chains. God wants to free you in some of that. And I've just found that obedience to God's word helps me overcome the deficiencies in my own life. That purpose, that plan, that making sure I'm in right step with God. And it gives me the ability to overcome even some inherited things. And so friends, what's important for us to be reminded is that this is the promise of God, not the perfection of his people. God always knew he was dealing with broken and flawed humanity. He always knew that. But he also always knew that he would be true to keep his promise. And his promise was to bless his people. And you and I 
are his people.